This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hey, very good morning to you. Join me as we are exploring liberation pedagogy. What does it mean? How can we use it? Should we be using it? We're going to explore all of those questions on the Saturday Breakfast Show this morning. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org, or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. Hey, very good morning to you. It is Saturday, the 18th of March, 2023. How is it already the 18th of March? Um, You know that here on Saturday Breakfast, I like to repeat myself. Um, And so I'm going to go back over something I said. It seems like five minutes ago, but was in fact three or four weeks ago. January was long. January was long. February was short. I mean, you know, that's just the calendar. February does only have 28 days. It is short by definition. Um, But March also seems to be going very, very quickly. I can't believe we are already past St. Patrick's Day. That was yesterday. Um, If you did not hear last week's show, that was all about St. Patrick's Day, about his life, about his writings. Um, I pulled from some audiobooks that, uh, that tell his story. So please, if you're interested, do go back and check out that show. Uh, But St. Patrick's Day has come and gone. We are now on the countdown to Ostara. For those of you who follow the Wiccan Wheel of the Year, Ostara is in fact next week. Um, For those of you who are Christian, culturally Christian, uh, or live in a culturally Christian country, we are on the countdown towards Easter already. It's uh, it's all coming thick and fast at the moment. But yeah, I can't believe how quickly we have gone through March. I cannot believe I've got my planner right here. I was doing some planning before coming on the air this morning. I can't believe that there's only, in fact, one, is it one full week? Yeah, one full week of March left here in my planner. And then we move into April. That is insane. That is insane. Anyway. You join me in a very busy Saturday morning breakfast studio today. I have cats who are very interested in what's go well, you know, as interested as cats can be in what's going on. One of them is more interested in the fact that I've just put the fire on. Um, She is loving that at the moment. The other that I've got downstairs here with me is interested in the birds who are outside, so I'm preparing myself for her to uh, to launch out the window. The third is in bed, hopefully being interested in whatever she is dreaming about and not yowling, uh, as she does like to do. I have got a dishwasher switched on in the background, so my apologies if you can hear that. Um, I managed to refrain from putting the washing machine on. Um, you will be glad to know. But it's got me thinking, where has this burst of energy come from? Why am I not flagging like I usually am on a Saturday morning, like I really was last week? Um, You know, I spoke last week about how my um, seasonal depression had kicked in. Um, I am feeling a little bit better this week. I think I'm beginning to adjust. Um, I'm still not enjoying how light it is in the evening. But I think, if nothing else, I think I've accepted that that's the time of year that we're in. And for me, that's the first kind of step towards getting better, is is accepting that we are moving towards the summer, uh, accepting that I'm going to feel a certain way for the next few months and starting to make the, um, make the effort to, to overcome that. Um, but yeah, I've been wondering why... I am not as exhausted as I expect to be on a Saturday morning. 
Um, and again, you know, particularly given how unwell I was feeling this time last week. And I've looked back at my planner and all of the stuff that I've done this week. I am entirely up to date on my marking. I have written year eight and year nine exams. So across four skills, speaking, listening, reading and writing. So I've written eight exam papers. I am planned through to the end of the term. We've got um, my school. We've got two weeks left um, the week coming up and the following week. So I planned all of my lessons for those two weeks. I have written the majority of my master's essay uh, is due at the end of the month. I would have finished it off. I would. Ooh. I had ordered a book from Amazon to um, to help write the end of my essay. And I've got Prime, so I ordered it Thursday. I was told that it was coming yesterday. Absolutely fine. Uh, I was given a delivery slot between one and three yesterday. So I was like, oh, perfect. Um, you know, it will be delivered when I finish work. I can sit down, I can read the book and I can write the end of my essay and it will all be done. That was the plan. It got to three o'clock. It hadn't been delivered. I was like, okay, I checked my Amazon account. Um, it was delayed, but there was guaranteed delivery by 10 p.m. So I thought, oh, okay, so it's going to come late. That's fine. That's, you know, that's not a problem. I can work on it after my show and after my tutoring on Saturday. Absolutely fine. Uh, got to 10 p.m. Still hadn't arrived. And I was like, okay. You know, that's fine. That's fine. I'm on Amazon Prime student, so I'm paying a reduced amount for it. So if the odd thing doesn't come next day, that's not the end of the world. Um, it The the thing was still saying it was going to come um, next day. So I was expecting it to come today. That was absolutely fine. Woke up this morning, checked my account. There was a problem with the delivery and my order has now been cancelled. I was like, OK, fine fine so they're going to reimburse me the money for the book which does mean that I need to keep an eye on that which is actually something that I don't think many people talk about it is great that when you have an order cancelled by a company they reimburse your money um, you know without you having to go through the steps of asking for it that is brilliant uh, and so Amazon I really do appreciate that you do that um, however it does then become an additional responsibility on my part to check that the reimbursement has happened. And it's not a big deal, is it, going into your bank account app or your Amazon account or whatever it might be and seeing whether the money has gone in. It's just an extra thing that you have to think about. Um, so in addition to, to not having my book, to not being able to finish my essay, I've got this extra task that I need to do to make sure that I get my money back. But anyway, that's all by the by. That's just a little detour. You know, we like a detour. We like a story here on Saturday morning breakfast. Um, so I had the intention of finishing that essay and I've got most of it. I've only got another uh, like 500 words to write. So I just need to find a source to replace the book that I was going to use. That's not a problem. Um, I have submitted an ethics plan for my second doctoral essay. I haven't started my first one yet but I have submitted my eth my ethics plan for my second. So it has been a super productive week. It really has. And so, you know, I should, by rights, like I said, feel very, very tired. Why don't I? And it clicked this morning um, as I was um, loading the dishwasher. I suddenly realised that the reason I'm not exhausted is because I'd had hardly any lessons this week. In a very rare alignment of the stars, I had a week where between mock exams and careers events and trips and illnesses and not being called for cover, I actually hardly had any teaching to do. I probably, in all honesty, could have fit my whole week's teaching into one school day this week. I've been very, very fortunate. And I think that's why I'm not as tired as I usually am. Not because teaching in and of itself is tiring, though it is, of course, you know, being in front of the kids, having that energy, doing that performance day in, day out, every day is tiring. 
But the fact of the matter is, as has really been driven home to me this week, ours, our job is in fact two full-time jobs. Teaching, being in front of the kids, is a full-time job. Doing the planning, doing the marking, writing the exams, all of that sort of stuff, is another full-time job. And this week, I was lucky enough, really, to only have to work one of my full-time jobs. I only had to do my paperwork part of my job because my kids were out and all that sort of thing. And I'm, I'm actually quite shocked because I think it's something that I kind of got used to. I think I just accepted a long, long time ago the fact that you just do a lot as a teacher, you know? You, you go in and you do what most people consider to be the job, the teaching, the bit that we all like, being with the kids, transmitting our knowledge, sharing what we know. And then they all go home and they do their homework and they play on their consoles and they watch TikTok and whatever else it is they do. And while they're doing that, we're planning the next day or the next couple of days or the next week or whatever it might be. Because if we don't do work outside of our contracted hours, we don't have anything to do in our contracted hours. We kind of have to make sure that we're doing our second full-time job, the paperwork, in order to be able to do our first full-time job, the teaching, effectively and properly. And again, that is just something that you accept. You know, when you when you start your teacher training, you just accept that. You can't plan a lesson while you've got a class in front of you. That's just common sense. And so you're going to have to do that when you've got some free time. But it really is remarkable how, um, how impactful that is. How that time and how that time pressure can affect you. And I think that's something that we do need to be very, very aware of. Because I do think it's very easy to fall into the trap of doing your full day at school, sending the kids away at 4.15, staying in school until about 5.30, going home, having something to eat, doing yet more work, the planning, the marking, the exam writing, whatever it might be, going to bed, getting up and doing it again. It's the old French phrase, metro boulot dodo. And that's not healthy. It's necessary, it's necessary, because otherwise we don't have anything to teach, but it's not healthy. So I think one of the things that I have learned this week, one of the things that I've taken from this realization is how I need to make sure that I am being as efficient as possible with my time. I like to think that I am quite efficient with my time. Uh, you know, I juggle lots of things. I always make sure that I've got something going on. Um, I keep my planner. My planner is very detailed so that I don't miss something. Um, and that's mostly a self-care thing because when I do miss something, I feel awful about it. That's where my anxiety can kick in. Um, so I keep my planner and I keep my plan detailed mostly to make sure that future Darren doesn't feel rubbish about not having done something. Um, but it's really, this week has really driven home to me how I need to make sure that I am being as efficient as possible with my time. That I am not over planning my lessons. Shouldn't under plan them either. But that I'm not filling time for the sake of filling time. That my marking is what the kids need and what they will respond to without being too onerous on time. Because what's the point in writing a full page of feedback on an essay if the student isn't going to pay any attention to it? I need to make sure that I am making most of my free periods. And this is where I fall down, is my free periods. Because it's very easy, I think, to treat your free period or your PPA time 
um, if you are a, a 10% PPA teacher, um, I think it's very easy to treat those as breaks because, you know, you, you've, let's say you've taught three lessons and then you've got a free period or you've got your PPA time and you are tired. Um, and this is what I do. I will tend to sit during my, my free with a cup of coffee and just decompress for, for 20 minutes before I start any work. But actually that ends up just being wasted time. Um, it's time when I could be doing my planning, I could be doing my marking. So yeah, it's been very interesting to think about that juggle, to think about the, um, the difference it makes to only have to do one full-time job as opposed to two, to only do the marking and the planning bit with minimal teaching. Um, and you know, I'm aware next week my class load is full again. My kids are, are, are back in full force and I will need to think about that. I will need to think about how I can very deliberately profit from the head start that I've given myself because I don't need to do any planning now for the next two weeks because that's all done. So I could sit down and say, oh, it's fine. I don't need to plan any lessons. I will take a break um, and I can plan again during the holiday or I can maximize my head start use the time that I would normally have used for planning to plan and be planning already into term five. I know that's what I should do. Um, ask me next week whether that's what I have done or perhaps don't ask me just in case, uh, just in case the answer is a little bit embarrassing. But yeah, I kind of wanted to leave, um, to, to leave you with that thought today about time, about what time means and about how we can maximize it. Because actually, as I've learned this week, working yourself to exhaustion is in fact time inefficient because everything ends up taking that little bit longer because you are very tired. So I personally, and I'm sure many of you do too, I need to think about how I am using my time, what my time means to me and just being very deliberate about what I'm doing. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. The latest budget has come under scrutiny from many quarters, with many working in education frustrated about a lack of focus on funding for education as a whole. Many have made comments on the £4 billion plan for childcare announced by Chancellor Jeremy Hunt with Paul Waugh writing an opinion piece for the I newspaper. In the piece, Waugh refers to gaping holes in the plan to provide free childcare for working parents of under fives. Childcare providers have already warned of the lack of funding detailed in the plan, and school leaders have expressed concerns that more money will need to be found from their already stretched budget if the proposed wraparound care is to be provided. Critics have pointed out that the new policy doesn't apply to those in apprenticeships or training and that there is no plan to ensure that an adequately trained workforce will be in place to deliver. The government has responded by proposing changes to the staff to child ratio, moving from one to four to one to five. But this has also raised concerns about a dilution of care. Since the budget announcement, many local authorities have published figures detailing how many children might qualify for a place in childcare under the scheme versus how many places are on offer at this time. Figures broadly suggest that, across the country, demand would far exceed places available. Many media outlets report on talks between England's education unions and government ministers. The talks will be met with what both sides describe as a period of calm for two weeks with no further strike dates announced. 
It comes after breakthrough talks with unions representing other public sector workers, including nurses and ambulance crews. The National Education Union said in a statement that it had, along with the NASUWT, NAHT and ASCO, agreed to intensive talks with Education Secretary Gillian Keegan. The announcement comes after walkouts in Wales and Scotland were postponed whilst unions ballot members on improved offers from the respective devolved governments. In Sunderland, the Echo reports on how former Lioness Jill Scott is helping girls have equal opportunities in football, after a pitch in Jarrow was opened in her honour. Scott was part of the England team who lifted the Euro 22 trophy last summer. While she's retired from playing the game, her involvement continues. In a speech as part of the opening of the new facilities, she said that girls and women's football would take priority on the new pitches. The pitches boast floodlights and 3G playing surfaces and were jointly funded by the government, the FA and the Premier League's Football Foundation. The new facilities link closely to the letter Scott and her teammates wrote to Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss, then Conservative leadership candidates, demanding all girls get the chance to play football at school. Scott said, I fell in love with football at school and pointed out that everyone should have the chance to do the same. Finally, ITV News reports on comedian Jason Manford's surprise appearance at a Leeds primary school. The comic was invited to the school after a video of him conducting an audience at one of his live shows in a sing-along of popular assembly songs went viral. The Assembly's Bangers sketch has since inspired a fundraising single, with profits donated to food bank charity the Trussell Trust. The comedian joined in with renditions of This Little Light of Mine, Lord of the Dance, and he's got the whole world in his hands. Footage of the visit is already making the rounds on Twitter. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, this week I'm going to talk about Deepfake. Deepfake uses artificial intelligence to create an image or video that appears to be real, but isn't. Amazingly, it's quite easy to do. It starts with a video or image of the target being uploaded to a Deepfake provider, Deepfake provider, found via a quick internet search. The AI then takes over and maps the landmark points of the target's face, just like the filters you find on popular social media apps. This is then overlaid onto another video or text-based script, and hey presto, you have control of what somebody is saying doing, wearing, or even not wearing. Oh wow. Detecting a deep fake is getting harder and harder. It started with people not blinking, but that was fixed pretty quickly. Sadly, there are lots of people making use of this for the wrong reasons, and our young people are being left to wonder what is real and what isn't. There's even something called a shallow fake, where an original video or audio is doctored using simpler editing tools to change the original message. The main questions you need to ask yourself are, why is this video being shared? When was the video published? Is the message something you'd never expect from that person? and who gains from this video. As always, if you have a tech question, why not send it to at TT Radio Official. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. You know that I'm a big fan of Steve and Two Minute Tech, and the the whole issue behind deep fake and shallow fake which is is new to me is very very scary and for me it brings to light a question that i've asked for a very long time which is why do we not do more to educate our young people about critical thinking in the media that they consume i teach mfl as you know um, MFL and classics are my primary subjects, my main subjects, um, but I also teach English. And in the English curriculum uh, in England and Wales, we actually don't really think about critically analysing media until A-level. So at GCSE, students will learn about the um, format of a newspaper, for example, the structure, they will learn how to write a headline, uh, you know, how to separate their pages, columns, and all of that sort of thing. But they don't really think about biases. They will learn about the difference between tabloids and broadsheets, but they will do that in terms of the features that they use rather than the messages that are being put out. And you have to wonder why 
a child doesn't get uh, doesn't start to kind of think critically about any of these messages until the age of 16. Maybe when I was at school, it wasn't necessary. You know, because it was assumed, I suppose, when I was at school that we wouldn't really pay a whole lot of attention to the newspaper. We probably didn't watch the news. I, I know that I didn't. I really didn't. But as our young people become more, what's the word that I want, more immersed in the digital world, digital literacy, media literacy becomes increasingly important. Now, um, I'm very privileged because my school actually does offer a compulsory course for our, um, yeah, I think it's year nine and year 10 children um, called digital literacy. And a lot of that is about learning how to operate in the digital world, learning how to, um, how to have the skills that it will be assumed that they have when they go into the workforce. But I do also think that it is our responsibility, either in a separate subject such as digital literacy, or perhaps in life skills, although the life skills curriculum is already very crowded, or in English, or even in modern languages, to, or in fact, thinking about it in classics, really, or media studies. In fact, all sorts of places, the more that I speak, I realise this could be fit in. To teach our children how to recognise not just what is blatant propaganda, because again, I know that they study propaganda in classics and in history, but the biases of everything around us, even the biases of the things that we agree with, which is something that I will come back to a little bit later on, hopefully. Um, but to remember that everything is created for an audience. Everything is created for some kind of gain, as Steve said, you know, be that because the person creating it wants to make money or because they want revenge on the target. Or, you know, if you are somebody who writes short stories and puts them out for free on the internet because you've got a story that needs to be told and kind of getting it out of your system benefits you um, personally, spiritually, emotionally, even if not financially. There is always a, a reason for something to be done. And I think it's very important that everybody, everybody is aware of why the media they are consuming has been created, what the leanings of that media are, and what the biases of that media are. And again, it's still biased. It, can, it will still be considered biased, even if it's a bias that you agree with. Bias doesn't mean it doesn't agree with my values. It means it espouses one set of values over another. And I think it's very important that everybody, from the moment they are deemed old enough to have a mobile device of their own, because that's the moment that they start consuming media without parental, um, without constant parental supervision. They need to be taught to consider what they're watching, consider what they're reading, um, and consider the messages behind it. Because I think it's only through that, it's only through the critical thinking that we will stop the deep fakes at the most extreme end of the spectrum having the life ruining impact that they can have. Because if, if they can be cut off at the, at the source, if somebody can receive a deep fake and go, oh, okay, that's revenge porn, for example, therefore I'm not going to pass it on, I'm not going to share it, I'm just going to report it to the police, which is what I should do, because they've been taught to recognise what the issues behind that deep fake are, then it's going to be less impactful on the victim than if it gets shared round to, you know, the entire school or the entire contact list of somebody's phone before somebody thinks to report it. 
in an already crowded school day, it's very hard to figure out where we fit that. I recognise that. You know, we all talk about how hard it is to fit in everything that we need to do. But at the same time, this is one of those, in inverted commas, life skill things. This is one of those, why will we not talk this at school things that actually we can teach. Because we've all been through critical thinking training. Just the virtue of doing a degree trains you to think critically about the sources that you are, con excuse me, that you are consuming. And so this is something that is in our power to teach. And it is something that perhaps we have a responsibility these days to teach our young people. And if that means that something else comes out of the curriculum, something that doesn't need our specific set of, um, of skills that can be taught at home, then maybe that does need to be replaced. Because that's the only way that we are going to, to, to stop these awful things from having the life ruining impact that they can. Well, that was very depressing. That was not where I was expecting to go after our two minute tech today, but it's important. It's important because it does impact on the lives of so many people all over the world. Um, something a bit less depressing was this idea of a 3D play, uh, three, 3D, three three 3G playing field. Uh, this is the second time that this has come up in, in my awareness this week. Um, the idea of these different gradients of playing fields. Um, I first encountered it earlier in the week when somebody told me about a 4G playing field, and I was so confused. I was so confused because I assumed that it meant a playing field that had Wi-Fi. And I couldn't figure out why somebody who was playing football would need Wi-Fi. Surely they can be off of their phone for 90 minutes while they are playing football. I, I didn't get it. Uh, so when it came up in the news just now, I googled exactly what this means. So for anybody who doesn't know, <laughs> apparently, according to um, SISPitches.com, this is where I am, um, there are multiple different types of pitch surfaces. It goes from a hybrid pitch, which is apparently 95% natural turf, which is then reinforced with 5% synthetic fibres, uh, and that is best for high-profile football and rugby, and is also used for cricket and golf. You've then got synthetic, astroturf, I suppose, 100% synthetic turf made using man-made fibres. And that's perfect apparently for clubs, schools and universities whose pitches require a lot of use all year round. They offer consistent performance and safety in all conditions. And then you have the Gs. So there's 2G, which is shorter and denser sand-based or dressed surfaces with a pile height of usually less than 24 millimetres. And that's good for hockey, tennis, and recreational football. Uh, um, it's also often used on Moogers, <coughs> the multi-use games areas. There's a 3G pitch. So that's what we had referred to in the news, uh, which is long pile synthetic grass with a pile height of 40 millimeters to 65 millimeters. That's often filled with a combination of sand and performance infill, whatever that might be. Uh, and that's good for football, rugby, and Gaelic Athletic Association sports. Then there's 4G, which is synthetic grass without the need for a rubber crumb. 5G, which is also synthetic grass without a need for a rubber crumb. And 6G, which is also synthetic grass without a need for a rubber crumb. Um, so again, quite what the difference up there in the 4, 5, and 6 Gs is, I'm not sure. Um, however, SISPitches.com tells us that it's important to note that technologies beyond 3G, so that is the 4, 5, and 6 Gs, are not yet recognised by sports governing bodies. So I suppose we will get more information on those as they, um, as they are recognised. But I think that's really interesting. Because for me, as a non-sporty person, 
I look at a pitch and I go, oh, that's grass. Or, oh, that's AstroTurf. I can tell the difference between grass and AstroTurf. That's fine. Um, but I didn't realize that there were so many different types of pitches. Um, I guess I shouldn't be surprised because we know that a lot of money goes into sports. We know that a lot of research goes into sports. We know that sports are very, very highly valued by educational institutions all over the world. And so um, I shouldn't be surprised that there had been research into different grass heights and the impact that that has on performance. Um, I think what does surprise me is that I can get to the age of 37, uh, having been in a school environment pretty consistently since I was four, uh, and not know any of this. It's really interesting. It. I wonder, PE teachers, you will be able to tell me, is this something that um, that you cover in PE lessons? Do, do children these days learn about the different types of pitch? Um, because we never did, I think. Obviously, as a non-sporty person, I only took core PE. I didn't take GCSE PE. Um, but I do not remember in the one PE exam that I ever took, I do not remember being asked about different types of pitch, about different heights of grass. Um, so I'm interested to know whether that is something that, uh, that our students learn about. Or is it one of those super niche things that really only the people who come and lay the pitches um, are worried about? And we're just happy that we have some kind of pitch to play on. It's interesting. This is one of the things that I love best about Teachers Talk Radio, is that there are all kinds of new things that I learn every time I come on to do a show. Which brings me quite nicely to my actual topic of today's show. Um, we've been exploring different pedagogies here on Saturday Morning Breakfast. So we have talked about um, constructivism, we've talked about social constructivism, we have talked about um, Socratic questioning, we've talked about all sorts of different things. And when I was planning today's show, I realised that I wanted to really learn something completely new, because all of the stuff that, that we've talked about before um, was where pedagogies were ideas that I was familiar with, that I was either trained in or that um, that I've experienced in my own practice. And I wanted to, to explore something completely new today because I was wondering what pedagogies exist out in the world that kind of never made it to the UK. Or if they did make it to the UK were abolished, for want of a better word, uh, before I got to school and before I did my training. And I discovered, as I was doing my research, I discovered this idea of liberationist pedagogy. Education for liberation is another way that it's phrased. Um, and as I've researched it over the past couple of days, I found it really interesting um, because of some of the questions it raises in terms of what education means, uh, what education looks like, and how we define the young people in our care. So that's kind of what we're going to talk about today, is this idea of uh, a liberationist education. If you have anything to add, because like I said, I'm learning about this kind of with you. The, the point of my show today is to kind of talk through all of the stuff that I've picked up over the last few days and kind of make meaning on the air, thinking out loud, essentially. So if this is a pedagogy that you are particularly familiar with, if this is a pedagogy that you practice, and so you've got some insights for me, some hints, some tips, some ideas, please do get in touch. If you're on the Podbean app, you can call in or you can text in. 
If you are not listening via the Podbean app, you are free to tweet me. I am at Mr. D. Lester, M-I-D-L-E-S-T-E-R. That's all one word. And I will happily read your tweets out on air if we are live while you are tweeting me. If you tweet me and it's after the show, if you are listening back on Spotify, on Apple Music, on YouTube, on any of the places that we are available, um, I will happily reply to your tweet because as I always say, these are things that interest me and my interest in these topics doesn't disappear uh, just because I've gone off air. So I will happily engage with you in conversation. So we're going to start by talking about um, Paulo Freire. Uh, Now, I apologise. I am a linguist, but Portuguese is not one of my languages. Um, So if I have um, butchered Mr. Freire's name, I do apologise. And I will happily be corrected by any Brazilian Portuguese speakers. But Paulo Freire was born on the 19th, 19th of September 1921 in Brazil. Um, He was born to a middle-class family, which is both interesting and important for what's coming as a result of his work. So he was born to a very firmly middle-class family uh, in 1921. But of course, having been born in the 1920s, he grew up through the Great Depression. And so even though he was a member of the middle classes, he did experience what we would consider abject poverty. Hello to uh, Rakesh Sudan, who has texted in to say that you are tuning in for the first time. It's great to have you here. I really hope that you find our show today interesting. Thank you for interacting. Thank you for texting in. So Furry became very familiar with poverty through living through the depression. Um, He ended up falling very far behind in school, about four grades behind. Not because he wasn't interested, not because he wasn't intelligent, but because he was hungry. He said, Um, In one of his books, he wrote, I didn't understand anything because of my hunger. I wasn't dumb. It wasn't lack of interest. My social condition didn't allow me to have an education. Experience showed me once again the relationship between social class and knowledge. And of course, this is one of the things that certainly in England, we have recognised and we attempt to remedy with wraparound care. So in most schools, particularly primary schools, wraparound care these days is is called breakfast club and after school club. And one of the reasons that breakfast is offered at breakfast club is as a kind of additional benefit to some children whose parents might not be able to afford that third meal in the day. It is, if we're very honest, the same reason that hot school meals, particularly at primary school, exist in the first place. You know, in British English, we have the conversation between what's the difference between dinner and tea? Because where I'm from in Gloucestershire, we would say that your middle meal of the day, your 12 o'clock, one o'clock meal, that's your dinner. And then your evening meal is your tea. And that's kind of what I grew up saying. That's what I grew up calling it. And, you know, that was what I went through at school. We had dinner time, 12 o'clock till one o'clock. And I came home and I had my tea. Um, And it wasn't until much later in my life, when I was studying English, that I realised why that was. And it's because dinner is your biggest meal of the day. So where schools, particularly primary schools, started offering a hot meal in the middle of the school day that was intended to be the child's dinner because it might be that when they got home they would only have you know a bread and jam supper and that would be their tea that would be their small meal and when the whole school lunches uh, initiative was launched again that was the reason behind it because many parents we're talking post-war Britain now. Many parents in, in houses that were still on rationing, 
in houses that were recovering from the war, they couldn't afford to give their child a big hot meal at the end of the day. And so they had it at lunchtime, at dinner time. My granddad, who went to school in the 1930s, 1940s, used to tell me stories of, of taking a potato with him to school. So every morning, his mum would pack him off when he was like four or five years old with a potato. And he would get to the schoolroom and his teacher would put the potato on the heater, on the fire uh, that they were using to, to warm themselves. And by lunchtime, by dinner time, that potato would be cooked. And that meant that his parents didn't need to, you know, they could afford the potato, but they didn't need to spend the money on fuel heating up to feed him. And it also meant that he had a nice big hot lunch in the middle of the day. So we recognise the link between being appropriately nourished, being appropriately fed, and even if we're taking nutrition out of the equation, just being full and being able to concentrate, being able to learn. And that was a big thing that Freire picked up throughout his own schooling. He fell four grades behind, according to him, because of his hunger. His social life outside of school uh, was mostly spent playing football with the other children in his neighbourhood. So, you know, he was, for all intents and purposes, an inverted commas, normal child. He didn't spend all of his time reading. He didn't spend all of his time um, trying to catch up with those four grades that he fell behind. But he did have a very strong social life. And he wrote that it was from those children, when they were playing football out in the street, that he learnt a lot. Now, eventually, his family's, um, his family, his family's circumstances is what I'm trying to say. His family's circumstances improved. And they were able to turn their misfortunes around and start to earn money. And Ferre found himself in a position of relative privilege. So in 1943, he enrolled himself in law school. And he was training to be a solicitor, but he also studied phenomenology, which is the structure of experience and consciousness. And he studied the psychology of language. Um, he passed law school. He was admitted to the Brazilian bar, uh, but he never practiced. Instead, he took a job as a secondary school Portuguese teacher. Um, that was where he met his first wife, Elsa. Um, they had five children between them during the course of their marriage. He was a very successful teacher, and by 1946, he was appointed director of the Pernambuco Department of Education and Culture. He worked predominantly amongst the illiterate poor, and he developed a, an area of practice that would eventually have a big, big impact on the uh, liberation theology movement of the 1970s. Uh, liberation theology is a Christian approach that suggests that the poor should be liberated by the uh, from their oppressors, that everybody who is oppressed should be liberated from their oppressors, um, and that from a Christian perspective, inequality should be removed because it works against a Christian message. And so liber liberation theologians pulled a lot on Freire's work when they were putting uh, liberation theology together in the 1970s. Now, the reason that Freire did this and the reason that he worked mostly with the illiterate poor was that in the 1940s in Brazil, literacy was actually a requirement for voting in presidential elections. You could only vote if you could read and write. And so what that meant was that, of course, lots of the poor 
were not able to vote because they were not able to read and write, perhaps because, like Freire, they had been too hungry in school to focus properly and so had not learnt. Perhaps they hadn't been to school at all. Perhaps they'd been pulled out by their parents in order to work because the family couldn't afford not to have that wage coming in. There would have been all sorts of reasons. And of course, that potentially was the point, was to kind of keep in power the people for whom literate people would vote. In 1961, uh, he became director of the Department of Cultural Extension at the University of Recife. Uh, and in 1962, he had the opportunity to apply his, uh, his theory, his pedagogy, for the first time in a large scale. He did an experiment in which he taught 300 sugarcane harvesters to read and write in 45 days. So they went from not being able to read and write at all, functionally illiterate, to having total literacy in just 45 days. Now, clearly, the um, attitudes of the Brazilian government had changed in those 20 years because as a result of his experiment, the Brazilian government approved the creation of what were called cultural circles across the country, where those who had not learned to read and write as children were taught and were able to. Now, unfortunately, this was all um, stopped in 1964 by the Brazilian coup d'etat. Um, which was a series of events between March the 31st and April the 1st that uh, resulted in the overthrow of President João Goula um, by the Brazilian military. Um, now, the, the military did not endorse Freire's literacy um, ambitions, and so they just scrapped completely everything that had been put in place. He was exiled to Bolivia for a little while before moving to Chile, where he spent five years working for the Christian Democratic Agrarian Reform Movement. And he also worked in the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. It was during this time that he published his first book, which was called Education as the Practice of Freedom. Um, yeah, that was in 1967, and then that was followed up in 1968, so very fast turnaround, I'm very impressed with his work ethic, um, by his most famous book, which is called Pedagogy of the Oppressed. And it's in there that he, he outlines his um, pedagogy of liberation. His work was received very positively internationally, and he was offered a job at Harvard University in 1969 as a visiting professor. Um, in 1970, Pedagogy of the Oppressed was translated into Spanish and English out of Portuguese, which hugely expanded the educationalists who were able to reach it. Unfortunately, though, the book remained unpublished in Brazil until 1974, due to the political differences between Freire himself, who was a Christian socialist, and the military governments of Brazil, which were right-wing authoritarian. After his year at, uh, at Harvard, Freire moved to Geneva, where he worked as a special education advisor to the World Council of Churches. Uh, he worked as an advisor on education reform to several of the former Portuguese colonies in Africa, especially um, Guinea-Bissau and Mozambique. In 1979, he finally went back to Brazil for the first time in about a decade of exile, and uh, he moved back permanently in 1980 where he joined the Sao Paulo Workers' Party 
acted as a supervisor for the adult literacy projects between 1980 and 1986, and became Secretary of Education after the Workers' Party won the 1988 Sao Paulo mayoral elections. Uh, he died of heart failure in 1997 in Sao Paulo. So we got to spend that, he got to um, spend the rest of his days back home, which was nice. So there we have a brief overview of his life. A lot of religion in there, which is perhaps one of the reasons why the pedagogy hasn't become as well known as others. Because, of course, lots of educational systems try to keep a separation of church and state. A lot of work with the underprivileged. A lot of work in the agriculture and the agrarian domains. And a lot of work in third world underprivileged at that time countries. So we can very clearly see straight away, before I even talk to you about what his pedagogy entailed, you can probably start guessing what it meant, because it will have been informed by his politics. And again, this is something that is very important for us to remember, is that one of the tenets, I suppose we could call it, of uh, this type of pedagogy is the idea that education and politics cannot be separated, that doing so is impossible. This is, of course, against what many modern teachers will say and against what we are advised as teachers. We don't discuss politics. And where we do discuss politics, we don't give an opinion. As a teacher, we try and give a balanced viewpoint on everything, where a balanced viewpoint, of course, is necessary, or where a balanced viewpoint is valid. So I think most teachers will tell you that when they're in the classroom, they are apolitical. Freire said that that's not possible, that education cannot be apolitical, and to a certain extent, he had a point. Because we can make our lessons apolitical. We can stand in front of a class and never mention who we voted for, never mention whether we voted at all. And in fact, if students have asked me about voting, I always make a point to say, yes, I voted. Um, but I don't want to tell you who I voted for because I don't want to influence your opinions. You need to go out and do the reading. You know, I try and maintain that very professional, distanced outlook. But the stuff that I teach is political. Because the stuff that I teach is dictated not by what I think is necessary in my curricula, but by what exam boards think is necessary in a curriculum. By what exam boards are deciding is going to be on an exam. And of course, depending on how you define politics, you could say, as I am, that that's political. It may or may not be about individual political parties. It may not be about who is in government, although there is a standing joke in, in England and Wales that every time there is a new government, we know there's going to be a new curriculum. So, you know, the government does have that impact. But as an entity, there are certain politics within individual exam boards that will impact what they think should be tested. If I think about the MFL curriculum, for example, the choice of films and literature on offer is determined not by me, but by the person who sets the exam. So from the list, I can decide what films I want to offer. And that often can be a political choice because I might choose the film that I think my students can most relate to based on their experiences. Or in the case of A-level Chinese, I actually choose the film that relates back to the um, 
history topic that I teach, which is about the opening up of China to the West and about migrant workers. And, and so I, I try and um, join those two things together to reinforce my learning, my teaching, their learning. But it's decided by these people that I've never met, that I've never heard of, and who all come to set this with their own interpretations, their own biases of what they think is important. And it's that idea of what is important that itself is political. And so I can see where, where Freire is coming from by saying that it's impossible to, to separate education and politics. And again, that's not saying that it's impossible to separate education and government. Because, of course, in the UK, if you do not want to send your child to a government funded school, you have the right to send them to an independent school or to a uh, or, or to homeschool them. But the decisions that we make as teachers are informed by all sorts of things. And again, depending on how you are defining politics, it is arguable that all of these decisions are political. But of course, what Freire was mostly concerned with was not actual politics in terms of the games that are played between people in positions of power but in that difference between who was in power, who had the power, and who did not. Between what he termed the oppressor's oppressed distinction. So the, the root of um, liberationist pedagogy is that there are people who are oppressed, it needs to be recognised that they are oppressed and they need to be empowered to break away from that oppression. That is essentially what um, liberationist education boils down to. And that oppression, that, that breaking free of the oppression, needs to start right from the beginning of a child's schooling, of a child's education, which is in fact the moment they are born. Because if we look at um, Bobby Harrow's cycle of socialization, we have all of these different ways that children are taught that don't involve school. Um, Litspit has texted in with a very interesting question. Are teachers into secret societies? Um, I can't speak for all teachers, obviously, um, but I can tell you that I'm not. Um, <laughs> I have no interest in being in a secret society. To be honest, I have no interest in researching secret societies. Um, it's not for me and i'm sure it's not for the vast majority of my colleagues as well honestly we've got a bit too much to do to be going to all of these meetings and and whatever else goes on in secret societies so i can tell you from my point of view my answer is going to be no um if any teachers are into secret societies and would like to answer lit's bits question differently to how i have done please do text in I'm quite happy for you to do that. Uh, but no, from my point of view, absolutely not. Anyway, going back to this cycle of um, cycle of socialization, the idea is that we are born into a world that has these mechanics in place, but we don't understand them because we are born with no information to start with. And the information that we pick up, the biases, the stereotypes, the prejudices, the history, they are all taught to us by the people around us. So we start being socialized by parents, by relatives, by teachers, by the people that we love and trust. Um, 
and we pick up values through them. Okay, we pick up values through the people who are around us because we kind of copy until we learn to think critically, which is what I discussed earlier on um, with the whole concept of the deep fakes and all of that sort of thing. We just take for granted what we see around us as being, in inverted commas, normal. All right, so that's this first socialization. And again, that's political. One of the reasons that we have voting ages, and those voting ages are usually around 18, is so that the person has had enough exposure to the world to form their own decision of who to vote for instead of just copying their parents. Because that is quite normal, that is just something that happens. You grow up initially with your parents' values, with your parents' understanding of right and wrong, and it's through your own experiences that you may or may not begin to question those. So it's through this socialization that we inherit and reproduce the dominant norms and frameworks of our society, that we accept those as being common sense or normal or natural. We then move on, and if we don't have these things challenged, we just continue to believe them. And again, this is where we can argue that education is political, that, that education and politics cannot be divorced from each other. Okay, We have seen in the UK media lately this idea that the RSHE curriculum needs to be readdressed because people are complaining about what is being taught in RSHE, um, about the propriety of things that are being taught. And I said on Twitter the other day, who decides what is appropriate? Are things appropriate to be taught in school because they align with your beliefs and values and anything that does not align with your beliefs and values is inappropriate? Because if that's how we're defining propriety, then that's always going to have somebody saying, no, this is inappropriate. Because for every stance you can take, for every viewpoint you can take, there will be an opposite. Which means that in schools, realistically, we can never win. Because there will always be somebody opposing what we are saying. If we do anything other than teach very explicit facts that are verified and concrete, then there can and will be an opposing opinion. And again, we need to kind of teach our students how to deal with those opposing opinions. That you can hear what somebody else says and not take it as a personal attack. And not necessarily be swayed, but you can be swayed if you think they are convincing, that you can assimilate new information and either go, oh, okay, that's what you think, that's interesting, people think that, I think the opposite, or, oh, that's what you think, actually that makes more sense than what I used to think, so that's what I'm going to think now. You know, it, it's all about that, those changing of opinions. It fits in with the social constructivism that we talked about a few weeks ago. So with all of this in mind, with, with all of this idea of socialization underpinning Freire's model, he attacked what he called the banking concept of education. Um, in, when I was in my initial teacher training, this was called the VAS concept. And it's this idea that children are empty receptacles. So in Freire's analogy, they are a, an empty bank vault and that teachers put uh, knowledge into their head in the same way that you put money into a bank vault. 
Honestly, if that were true, how easy would our job be? I would love it. I am not going to lie to you. I would love it if I could just stand up in front of a class, tell them something and have it go into their head. That would be amazing. That would make our job as easy as everybody likes to say it is. But we all know that that's not how it works. And Freire attacked the idea that this was how it worked. So he was a proponent of this idea that everything that we know, in inverted commas, comes from the people around us. But of course, what does that mean in terms of liberation, which was at the, the, the heart of his pedagogy, the heart of his idea? What does this mean for social change? For him, it meant that those who are oppressed need to recognize that they are oppressed and take whatever steps they can to break out of their oppression. And at the same time, those who are the oppressors need to recognize that they are oppressors and do what they can to remove whatever is in place that they are doing that oppresses the oppressed. So it essentially involves both sides of that oppressor oppressed scale understanding what their role in the scale is and doing something to address it and it's quite interesting to me that Freire didn't put all of the power I suppose all of the responsibility into the hands of the oppressor he didn't say it's the job of the oppressor to change he did say that the oppressor must change, but the oppressed must also do what they need to do in order to provoke the change. And from an educational point of view, that's really interesting because as teachers, particularly these days, we are told that everything comes down to us. I talked before about the, the teaching and learning scale and how it should be a relationship between me as the teacher, disseminating the information, creating the opportunities for children to learn, and the children as the learner, making the most of those opportunities and, and actually doing the learning, engaging in the system. And the liberation pedagogy gives the learner that responsibility. It tells the learner that you do, in fact, have to learn in order to mobilize yourself. You know, the sugarcane workers that Freire worked with, they had to learn to read. The oppressive system that stopped illiterate people from being able to vote, that had to be removed by the oppressors. But at the same time, those who were oppressed could take responsibility for themselves and learn. And I suppose Freire was coming from a place where he had caught up with his schooling. I suppose he was being um, influenced by his own politics, if you like, of going, well, I turned my fortune around. I was four grades behind in school, but now I've passed all school and I'm a Portuguese teacher and, and, and. So if I can do it, so can you. And of course, there are all sorts of issues there with systemic power and privilege and what actually gave Freire the right to say, if I can do it, so can you. But of course... There are critiques of all pedagogies. There are critiques of all ideas. And essentially, honestly, that's what his pedagogy boils down to. It boils down to this idea of education as a way of liberating people. Education as a way of equalizing communities. But in order to do that, in order to equalize, both parties, the oppressor and the oppressed, need to take responsibility for what's going on and need to remove any barriers that are in the way. I saw a cartoon as I was, um, as I was researching this that kind of explained it quite nicely. There was the 
idea that we've all seen the the um, equality versus equity cartoon, the one where you've got three people watching a baseball game and they're standing behind a fence. Uh, equality, all three of them, the tall person, the medium sized person and the small person are standing on a box because they've all been given the leg up. The tall person can still see over the fence, the medium sized person can see over the fence, but the small person can't, even though he's been given the box. Then there's the equity, where the tall person doesn't have a box to stand on, he can see over the fence. The medium sized person has one box to stand from, he can see over the fence. And the small person has two boxes to stand on and he can see over the fence. And then for the first time, as I was researching this, I saw the liberation panel, which removed the fence. So there were no boxes, but the fence was removed. And so it was about removing the, the institutional things that stop people from being able to proceed. But then at the same time, not giving anybody a particular advantage over anybody else. It's just about removing the systemic issues that are in place that prevent people from learning. I think that that's very difficult, if I'm honest. I think it's a lovely idea, but a lot of, and, and this is where a lot of the critiques of Freire's work come in, I've noticed, a lot of what he was doing was on small scale community, grassroots, if you like, initiatives. And I think if you've got a school system where schools have um, autonomy, total autonomy, so a school can choose exactly what it teaches, then I think that's doable because you can start to look at the systemic issues within the society specifically around you, in your neighbourhood, in your village, in your town, in your city, wherever it might be, and educate about those to start removing those barriers. Where you have a nationwide school system, like we have in uh, England and Wales, for example, that's much harder because you are teaching a curriculum that is available to everybody and it's kind of the same curriculum for all and so there is a lot there are fewer opportunities to get out into your into your neighborhood into your surroundings and figure out how to promote equality it also opens up to abuse in terms of teaching who are the oppressed people and who are the oppressors. Because again, depending on your personal viewpoint, you could have very different ideas about it. You might always look at the people whose values align with yours and go, they are the oppressed and they are being oppressed by these people whose values don't align with mine. And we see that all the time. You know, you can't spend five minutes on any kind of social media without looking at um, or without seeing news about uh, different kinds of rights, about economy, and everybody always feels like they are the person being oppressed and that the person with the opposing viewpoint is the one doing the oppressing. And I do think that if you, again, give schools complete autonomy to decide who is being oppressed and who is doing the oppressing, this is when you start opening the trap that we quite often get accused of, of indoctrination. Of suggesting that schools are influencing the politics of the young people by telling them who are the oppressed and who are the oppressors, which at the moment is something that schools don't do. And so it's an interesting theory. And it's one of those things that I think really works in theory. But in practice, it's much, much harder. Um, and I think potentially that's why as a pedagogy, it never really took off. 
I think why as a pedagogy, that's something, it's one that I had never encountered until three days ago. You know, 16 years into my teaching career, 19 years, if you account for my training, never heard of it until I googled unusual pedagogies and I encountered this one. So what have I learned is the big question, because like I said at the top of the show, this this show was kind of an experiment, really. It was me talking through this pedagogy, which at its roots is actually very simple. It's just this idea of the oppressed and the oppressor working together to achieve equality. So it didn't need, how long have I been talking about it? 40 minutes, really, for me to explain that. I could have explained it once and then put the news back on. But in talking it through, I think I have learned that there are all kinds of pedagogies out there that I was perhaps naive in assuming that my initial teacher trainer providers had briefed me on all of them and had allowed me to choose the one that I think works best. What they had done is briefed me on the ones that perhaps were in vogue or I don't know, maybe they have the most um, science behind them. And it's made me realize that there are all sorts of pedagogies out there that I have never heard of and that might not work in the British system, which is why I haven't heard of them, but might work in a completely different country with a completely different set of issues that need to be addressed. It's all really interesting, in my opinion, the fact that there are all of these different ways that teachers can teach. And no one can decide how a teacher should teach. Because we're always going to come at these things from completely different points of view. And for me, that's one of the joys, I think. And that's one of the, the reasons I think it's good for schools to exist so that children can encounter different people, they can encounter different teachers, they can encounter these different ways of being taught and decide ultimately what works for them. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Okay, Lit Spits, I want to thank you for your engagement with the show today. Uh, your questions are super interesting. Um, I am going to say, though, I'm not in a position to answer any of them. Um, it seems to me that you are coming from the US system. Um, I'm, I'm making that assumption. I apologize if I'm wrong. Uh, you've just mentioned something about the USA. Uh, I, of course, am in the British system. And I only have very minimal experience of teaching and learning in the US. So I'm not the right person to answer all of these questions that you've asked. Um, I will tell you that, no, I have never been contacted by the Illuminati. Um, I, If the Illuminati exist, I am probably not interesting enough for them to contact. To be honest, they're not going to want me. Um, my subjects are foreign languages, modern and classical, um, English. And you ask good questions about um, about those differences between the oppressors, the oppressed, who are the non-oppressed. Um, hopefully, I answered that when I talked a little bit about um, how everybody can feel like they are being oppressed. Everybody can feel like they are the oppressor. And I think, again, it's probably a political decision about who you consider to be the oppressed and the non-oppressed. Uh, am I into etymology? Litzbit asks, absolutely. Um, etymology is in fact one of my specialisms. Um, 
I have a range of etymological dictionaries in a range of languages up on my bookshelves. Um, and I very, very rarely use a word if I do not know where it comes from, because I believe that language has power. I believe that the history of language has a lot of power. And I believe that that power needs to be used properly. That is it for our show today, I'm afraid. I hope that you have found this useful. I do just want to return before I sign off to my point from the beginning. So in case you missed the top of the show, I pointed out that I feel really good today within myself. And I do put that down to only having to have done the admin parts of my job because my teaching this week was very minimal. So everybody out there, teachers, of course, I'm talking to you, but I do think this applies to most people. One of the things that we have seen uh, from the response to the strikes is that everybody these days feels that their job asks more than they are paid for, feels that they are taking home too much work feels that they are working through their holidays. All of the things that we as teachers talk about as kind of downsides of our job, these are things that that people in all professions these days are talking about. So to everybody, I'm going to say take care of yourselves, prioritise your mental health. We heard this week about a teacher a head teacher who has committed suicide, sadly, allegedly um, influenced, at least in part, by a school inspection. And we should never get to that stage. We shouldn't be allowed to get to that stage where our job impacts our mental health that much. We can't always control that. Again, I'm very open about the fact that I have an anxiety and depression diagnosis. And I know that I can't always control how I respond to things. I can't control how things make me feel. There should not be different um, institutional things that make us feel worse about our jobs than we feel already. But we do have the responsibility to take care of ourselves. Again, in the same way, I suppose, that Freire talked about the oppressed having just as much responsibility to be educated as the oppressors have for removing those barriers. We as teachers, we as people who feel that we are overworked regardless of what um, domain we might be working in, have a responsibility to take care of ourselves so that we can do our jobs properly. To pull out that old cliche, you cannot fill from an empty jug. Although, of course, we're not filling at all because we don't believe in the bank hypothesis of learning. Thank you all so much. It's been an interesting show for me today. I hope that you have found it interesting too. Um, We have quite a lot lined up here on Teachers Talk Radio over the weekend and over the week. So do tune in listen to what we've got going on, hear some of these varying opinions. Don't create an echo chamber for yourself. Listen to what other people have to say and decide for yourself whether you're going to take it on board or whether you're going to say, oh, that's an interesting theory, but it's not for me. Thank you very much. And I will speak to you next week. Thank you and goodbye. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.